I want to show you the exclusive access that CNN has been given to the massive international security operation to keep vital infrastructure safe from Russia's military in Ukraine. A military, of course, that is both reckless and irresponsible in addition to targeting that infrastructure. A military that Russia continues to celebrate. The defense minister today decorating the pilots who took down that American drone over the Black Sea, even though it appeared to be accidental that they hit it. I want to start with Fred Pleiken and his exclusive reporting on how the international community is bracing for possible new attacks by Russia. He's out front live tonight in Bergen, Norway. And Fred, what are you learning? Hi there, Aaron. Well, we're learning that NATO and the U.S. alliance certainly are not taking any chances as far as that is concerned. They saw what happened to that U.S. drone over the Black Sea, and they're extremely concerned about critical infrastructure among the U.S.'s allies here in Europe, specifically energy infrastructure. So what we did today is we went onto the North Sea, onto one of the biggest gas platforms on the North Sea, and we saw that NATO is really beefing up its presence there. Here's what we learned. As tensions mount after the collision between a Russian plane and a U.S. drone over the Black Sea, NATO's head tells me the alliance stands firmly behind the U.S. What you have seen is a, a reckless uh, and irresponsible behavior by uh, Russia that led to this incident in the uh, Black uh, Sea. The good thing uh, is that uh, the United States behaved utmost uh, professionally. And security on the seas is a huge issue for NATO. We flew to one of Europe's largest gas fields with the Secretary General and the head of the EU Commission as NATO warships were guarding the rig, watchful for possible acts of sabotage. The U.S. and its allies understand full well that Russia's war in Ukraine is a threat not just to the skies above the seas and on the seas, but also to critical infrastructure under the sea as well. That's why the NATO alliance is beefing up its efforts to protect this critical infrastructure. These are the actual wells of the Troll gas field near Norway. Around 10% of the natural gas supplies for America's European allies come from this field alone after most of them stopped buying gas from Russia. Last year, the Nord Stream pipeline between Germany and Russia was blown up in what the U.S. says was an act of sabotage. While some believe Ukrainians might be behind the explosion, Kiev denies involvement, and the EU Commission head tells me Europe will continue to support Ukraine. We know in the European Union that Ukraine is not only fighting for its independence, sovereignty and freedom, but also for uh, the wider values we share like the respect for the international law. And the Ukrainians say they will fight on. Kiev saying the most intense battles are still taking place around Bakhmut, where the Russians claim they're gaining ground. And Russian President Vladimir Putin is set to meet Chinese leader Xi Jinping in Moscow next week as the Russians are looking to further deepen ties and the U.S. believes want Beijing to give them weapons. NATO's leader says security in Europe will only be guaranteed if Putin ends the war against Ukraine. The best way to uh, reduce risks of uh, incidents uh, like this is, of course, for President Putin to end the war. Wars are dangerous and they lead uh, uh, to dangerous situations uh, like the incident of the Black Sea. But as long as the war continues, NATO says its ships will stay on alert, shielding the alliance members' critical infrastructure from possible attacks. And anyway, Aaron, there were several warships from the NATO alliance around that gas platform alone, just to show how important that is. In the meantime, of course, we know that the fighting in Ukraine is really ferocious and continues to be ferocious. I got an update from the Ukrainian military, and they say, especially on the northeastern front in Kremlin, there's a lot of fighting going on. But of course, also, as you mentioned, in Bakhmut as well, where the Russians are continuing those efforts to try and encircle that city. Well, at the same time, as you said, some Ukrainian soldiers believe that they might have exhausted that Russian force Force, and they could see an opening uh, to, to try and launch a counterattack there as well, Aaron. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, let's go now to Christo Grozev, the lead Russia investigator for Bellingcat. He has been put on Russia's wanted list for his work uncovering the men who poisoned uh, Putin opposition uh, leader Alexei Navalny. And you can see all of that, of course, in the now Oscar-winning documentary Navalny. Also out front, Phillips O'Brien, professor of strategic studies at the University of St. Andrews, who, of course, has been so tirelessly uh, chronicling and following this war. So thanks so much to both of you. Um, let me start uh, with you, Phil. Fred mentioned 
Putin's upcoming meeting with the Chinese President Xi. And the U.S. believes that that meeting is in part because Putin wants China to give him more weapons. And I know uh, you've been looking at, at a lot of this. How bad is Putin's weapons shortage right now? Well, I mean, it, it, we have to understand Russia is not a great power economically. It, it's really a relatively small economy. It's not a productive economy. It's a resource extraction economy. It can't make nearly the amount of war material that it is using up at a vast rate. I mean, before the war, say it was making 200 tanks a year was one of the estimates. And yet they've lost you know, 16 to 700 tanks that we've seen destroyed. And they're probably could be hundreds and hundreds more that have also been destroyed. So if Russia is going to be left fighting to its own devices, it will run out of weapons. It'll run out of a lot of weapons much sooner than anyone uh, anticipated a year ago. So if Russia is going to fight a long war, and that seems to be what Putin is saying now, oh. he's going to need to get a regular and steady supply of Chinese weapons to do that. Well, it's pretty incredible when you lay that out, right? I mean, you're talking about knowing uh, that they've lost an eight-year supply of tanks, as you're saying, and that's that's obviously a, a very low estimate. So, yep. you know, Krista, when the context of this, uh, the International Criminal Court, making Putin a formal international pariah, right, with this warrant, right? So it's not as if uh, anyone in the world is going to change how they see this based on this, but it makes it formal. And you've spent a lot of time investigating Russian war crimes in Ukraine. So what does this mean for, for Putin, right? He's obviously not going to be able to travel anywhere that he could be arrested. Um, how does this impact him in Russia? Well, it does. And uh, whoever says that it's going to be ignored or maybe even hidden from the general public um, is wrong or has been wrong. We see that uh, leading Russian political figures had to comment on this today and make it even amplified in public in, within Russia because a lot of uh, bloggers, a lot of people on the Russian Telegram channel, which is the main source of information for most Russians about the war today, have started talking about the fact that he was indicted. And the reason why this matters is, first of all, it uh, eliminates a, a fantasy, a sort of a conspiracy theory that the Kremlin is trying, has been trying to promulgate among his people, that there's this global conspiracy that protects uh, uh, Putin, that protects uh, the big leaders, that it's all a game that is happening and that the West will never go after the big uh, wigs and uh, mm. like Putin. And what happened today is literally the the, the top wig was uh, was indicted and uh, an arrest warrant was issued. And think about the message that this will have for anybody below him, because while Putin will not be able to travel or will not travel to be arrested, I mean, a lot of people below him who know that they're committing crimes or they may be committing crimes may think twice because they're younger. They may hope to one day have to travel to their favorite destinations. I mean, even the second person who was invited, Maria Belova, um, she's much younger. She will, she has a hope for a new life after the war. And this acts as a deterrent to Putin's commanders, to people working in the system. So to try to understand um, the scope of what's happening on the ground here, Phil, when you look at the situation on the ground in Bakhmut, um, Ukraine is saying Russia's slowing down their attacks. Uh, obviously, I was just quoting a Russian, uh, a Ukrainian soldier saying that. I'm sorry. And I want to share a little bit more about what he had to say. He said, quote, the enemy was in a hurry, threatening, telling that Bakhmut was surrounded and sent its soldiers to be killed, in particular on our part of the front. Accordingly, the fighting was as intense as possible. It exhausted the enemy. Um, how Phil, you know, we're hearing this from all levels of the Ukrainian military right now, that the Russians are exhausted. Is that the reality? Is that sort of the way Russians want them to see it? And they're, they've got some kind of, you know, group coming in? And, and how many Russians really are dying right now in these battles? Well, I mean, there's a few things going on here. There seems to be at least temporarily, we don't know if it's a temporary or a longer term uh, relenting in Russian attacks, Aaron, that mm -hmm. you know, compared to last week when they were throwing everything in to try and take Bakhmut and, and attacking on both sides to the north and south, trying to get over the river. And the last few days, these offensives have stopped and the map hasn't changed. Now, what we don't know is if this is the kind of thing that is you know, a temporary thing. But you know, Russia has been trying to take Bakhmut for eight months yeah. Eight months they've been throwing troops at this town, and they still haven't been able to take it. So I think we can say, you know, what the Ukrainians have done is decided, and, and you know, what we don't know is what Ukrainian losses have been. But the Ukrainians yeah. have made the Russians pay a massive price to take Bakhmut. And as long as the Ukrainians' losses themselves are not as you know, nearly as high, then that was probably the right strategic choice. It's a terrible battle. It's a horrible battle. 
but it's one where the Russians, in some estimates, are losing five to one. That was a NATO estimate, five right. to one. Another NATO estimate was recently the Russians in the Bakhmut area could be losing 12 to 1,500 casualties a day. Now, that's not just killed, that's killed and wounded, but that the Russians are losing you know, huge numbers of troops to try and take this town and huge numbers of equipment. 